Hello, and welcome back to my channel. I'm E.D. Lewis, back with another review. This is part two of my Phantom of the Opera video. Um, and I'm not going to keep the mask on for much longer because it's already kind of uncomfortable. And I feel like it's squeezing my nose. But before we get started, please uh, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Um, the links for that are down below. Yeah, I'm going to take this off. <laughs> um, also on Wattpad, you can read some of my writings on Wattpad. You can also follow me on BookBub as well, and Goodreads. And if you're interested in my book, The Curse of Ridge House, is available right now in Kindle format for $2.99 and paperback from Amazon. The paperback's a little bit higher, but that's pretty normal for Kindles and, and paperbacks. Um... Also, please visit and like the official Facebook page of my book, The Curse of Ridge House. And um, if you are interested in more of my writing, um, you can read some of my writing on Wattpad, um, kind of my lesser works. Uh, you can find the first two chapters of my book and an, a shortened down, incomplete version of this, along with the professor, much of the juicy details are not there. If you want the juicy details in the full story, you'll have to buy this. It is only in Kindle form, and it is 99 cents. So it's pretty affordable, and it's called Alone with the Professor. It's an erotic MM short story. So check that out. All right. Now, of course, the last thing I... Um, the last video I did was not Phantom of the Opera. It was my Psycho video for my summer reading. Um, so we're getting back with part two of this series. So to recap, I talked about on the last video of Phantom of the Opera, which today is a gloomy day. I do have the window uh, blinds open and I do have the light on. Um, so that's why the lighting is this way and it's afternoon. Um... Let's recap. So the the uh, ingenue, the uh, growing ingenue, Christine Daae, uh gets to perform during the gala where the managers are changing hands at the uh, the uh, Opera Garnier in Paris in the 1800s, which is being haunted by a mysterious figure called the Phantom or the Opera Ghost. She's being trained by the opera ghost in, uh, her, uh, to um, boost her uh, musical talents. And he sees himself wholly responsible for it. So he eventually kidnaps her, and there's all kinds of stuff that ensues. Um, he is madly in love with her. She has a suitor from childhood who is greatly in love with her, the by Count de Chauny, named Raoul. And that's pretty much a quick rundown. I mean, if you've read the book or seen the movies, you know. Okay, so. I didn't want to spend much time on that. Because we're going to talk about the... Um, the classic version starring Lon Chaney. And there are three versions I have here. Two are in this uh, milestone collection. The Ultimate Edition, Phantom of the Opera. It's a little dated now, because it's from, like, 2003, so early 2000s, so over 10 years ago. Almost 20 years ago. Uh, I have not had this that long. <laughs> I've only had it for maybe a year or two. Probably two years. Um, which contains the original 1925 edition and the uh, 1929, which I have listed 1930, because that's when um, the film was released, re-released, and edited, and with new footage and sound and talk, you know, talking some dialogue. Um, added, it was released in 1930, but the uh, cut was from 1929. And then I have a 19, uh, 19, a 2011 film version, which came out in 2012, which was a re-edit of the film uh, with sound and stuff. And I'll talk more about that later. So, with The Phantom of the Opera, it was originally released in 1925, uh, directed, this ver the original version was directed by Rupert Julian and Edward Sedgwick, 
excuse me, and I'll explain why. It stars Lon Chaney, Mary Philbin, and Norman Carey as the three main characters of The Phantom, Christine, and Raoul. Uh, Raoul. The film was one of Universal's earliest horror films, uh, at, uh, of course, taking... Yeah, not taking place. <laughs> well, yeah, kind of, because different time period. Um, coming shortly after their uh, hit, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which that movie also starred Lon Chaney in the title role. And um, was another example of his great makeup expertise that he had in both this film and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, which I have not seen. I do have a copy of it. I have not seen it. I have not read the book. I've only seen the uh, dreaded Disney version. And the reason why I say dreaded Disney version is I know about the book and I know uh, some of the different, you know, several of the differences I've read into it. I've never read the book. And the story is completely different. It's kind of like the Disney version is a bit of a in a way, kind of like a whitewash in a way. We'll just call it kind of a whitewash because it's so sanitized. Of course, it's for children, but, you know. Um, so anyway, uh, production began in 1924 with Rupert Julian. The film uh, The film went through several uh, scripted endings before we got the ending that was used in the film, which was not directed by him. But by the time of uh, filming had... Uh, but by the time of the f filming the ending, but I cannot, why am I even reading my notes? By the time that they were uh, getting ready to film the ending, they went with an unscripted version, which included the Phantom dying of uh, kind of a broken heart thing, kind of broken by, you know, Christine's kindness and her um, purity. Um, that film, that ending no longer exists where you can watch it, but there is a motion comic on the other DVD I'll show you a little bit later as a special feature where you can kind of read and watch that ending. Kind of watch it. Um, I forgot to mention, Julian was, Rupert Julian was making the film more of a uh, gothic, you know, romantic gothic thriller. Um, that's an important detail that comes later with that, uh, in contrast to Sedgwick. Um, so, after the film was finished, they sent it in to test audiences who were not satisfied with it at all, and they wanted something more upbeat and something, you know, comical and stuff. So, a new script was drafted, and Western filmmaker, as in Westerns like Cowboys and stuff, um, Edward Sedgwick was brought in to, um basically update the film so what he decided to make uh with the script that he had um i don't know who wrote the script he did but it was a, a different writer than uh the one who wrote R rupert julian he wrote it as a romantic comedy uh with a with action elements added so when the uh film was prepared again for test audiences it was met with a very disastrous response. They thought the film lagged, and it was just... From the sounds of it, to me, it sounded very ridiculous. But it bombed miserably. So Universal finally decided to take the best of both films, mostly uh, uh, Rupert Julian's film. Trying to do this with one hand. And a little bit of uh, Sedgwick's uh, comedic parts, including Sedgwick's ending, where the, the Phantom is hunted down by a mob through the streets of Paris, which is the ending that we have. Um, it was finally released in late 1925, I think in November or October. I think it's October. With uh, mixed to positive reviews. So... Um, but it's become a classic nonetheless, and people, you know, adore it as one of, you know, one of the best adaptations of Gaston Leroux's book. It is the most faithful adaptation, and, um, like I said, it's very cherished. It's in the public domain now, but most versions you're going to find is, um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. So 1930 rolled around. The 1930 sound version rolled around. So shortly after, uh, the dawn of talkies... 
talkie films, you know, um, came about, Universal uh, made the decision to reissue the film as a partial talkie, which was the popular thing at the time during the transition between silent theaters and talkie theaters, or sound theaters. Um, some of the cast was recalled, including Mary Philbin and, um, Norman Carey, couldn't remember his name. Uh, Lon Chaney was not, he was under contract for MGM, and so he did not return, and he did not lend his voice since he was getting ready to be, uh, well, getting ready to be, there he made it. Um, his first talkie film, which ended up being his last film, was was getting ready to be released, and so it would be the first time you hearing his voice, and they didn't want confusion. So he did not return. But they introduced the character, a new character called the Phantom's Assistant, or Servant, and so he spoke for the Phantom in a couple uh, short clips. So, um, like I said, some of the cast was recalled in, back in 1929 to film some sound sequences and some new uh, scenes as well. Just under half of the film was reshot uh, by Ernst Limley and... Frank McCormick, so it got two new directors, adding to a total of four directors for the film. Um, and this included both synchronized music, sound effects, and of course, like I said, dialogue in certain sequences. Um, one of the synchronized music was actually an opera scene, which is, I think, the only shot, the only actual sound scene that still exists today. Some of the sound... Um, tracks do still exist for the uh, dialogue, but um, the scenes themselves don't exist. So, And I'll say that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so it was re-released in 1930, in early 1930, but unfortunately this film is, lost, is believed to be lost because uh, it had been destroyed in a fire in 1948, and so that's why I mentioned that only some soundtracks for, uh, still survive and a sound scene, which is an opera sequence. Now, most versions that you've probably seen are the reissue, but it's not the talky version because it has clips from both the talky version, and mostly the title sequence and the opera sequence, and a few shots where there's no dialogue, and scenes from the 1925 uh, original version. That was released. You can see um, a reconstruction of it, of the original, in this edition. There's a Blu-rays, and I think there's other editions. But you can also see on this the uh, reissue. It's usually called the 1929 reissue, and you can include some of those sound clips. But the thing with the or soundtracks. But the thing with the soundtracks is the dialogue, is that they had to change the speed to try and match it to uh, the silent film scenes because the film speed in silent film compared to talkies is different. It's a completely different sound speed. So they had to, I think, slow it down or something. So it sounds really weird. And the acting, the voice acting does not sound great from the actors. But anyway. So you can check both those out. There are some weird mysteries, though, before I get to that other DVD version. Um... I don't have my notes about it. Uh, there's that one is the the one that everybody has seen that has uh, the sequences in it. Nobody knows why that one was created because it's not the reissue from 1929. They said they were not going to be doing. They, Universal said they were not going to be releasing a silent film to send to still silent theaters at the time. It's possible it could have been meant for Europe or something. But they have no idea. It's kind of a mystery. There is one other little mystery, though. At the start of the 1929 version, there is this man with a lantern. But it does appear on some prints of the 1925 version. This man with a lantern comes in, and he stands in front of the camera and stands for a really long time. And you can tell that his mouth is moving. So this is obviously meant to be a speaking scene. Who knows? Nobody knows why it's there. There's no dialogue. 
there's no known sound uh, clips or soundtracks. There's no keep them on say tapes. That it was sound tapes or discs. Sorry, sound discs. Um, but there's nothing. There's not even really much of a mention of this guy ever talking. You can find it in some old VHSs and maybe a DVD somewhere. And I think there was a TV version where they added dialogue to it, but no one knows. So, and a funny little thing about that version that everybody's seen, it also has alternate shots because it was very common for that time to release for foreign language films instead of re, you know, releases in foreign countries. And there'd only be one print that would go around, so they just insert different um, intertitles in between for the different languages. They would film with two cameras side by side, and so you get slightly different angles. So some of that, um, one that everybody has seen has different angles, uh, different angled shots, but there's also some retakes that they must have done because you can watch uh, comparisons here on YouTube even where you can watch where the scenes are completely different. You know, like you'll see like the Phantom with his arms crossed and he's like, you know, talking to her and in the same, you know, Christine in some shot, some versions of the shot, you'll see where his arms are crossed for a moment, then they move and he's, you know, gesturing and he's not doing that in the other version. So, you know, there's an alternate take there. So that's also what the uh, version that everybody's seen has. It has some of the original silent, has some from the 1929 cut, it has some from an alternate cut, it has alternate angle shots, you know, it's a, it's a mix. Now, we have this, which I was talking about a little bit, and that is another release film, uh, version of the film from 19... I'm sorry, 2012, they did it in 19... In, damn it. <laughs> sorry, they did it in 2011. So, um, it is basically a... re-edit of the entire film from both, you know, versions, you know, the 1929 release and the 1925. Um, and they have added music to it, an original music score. They've added dialogue to everything. So now it's a talkie. It's the fan as a talkie. And it's also has sound effects added to it. And it's a complete re-edit, like I said. And they even gave a voice to the lantern guy. So, you know, so i checked this one out if you're interested to see what the Phantom of the Opera would be as a talkie. I mean, it's not what it would have been because they only would have had certain sequences, but it's an interesting little, you know, experiment, I guess you call it. And there is a 3D version on the second disc, and this also has the, in the special features, you can watch that uh, motion comic version of the original ending, but... Um... But I will warn you, I tried to get the 3D to work on a TV correctly. I tried to get it to work on a, la on a computer. It just doesn't really work. All it makes it really look like is it gives like some things depth. It does not look like it's coming on the screen. It's done in the old-timey 3D with the, you know, the, the colored lenses. So. But it's an interesting book, uh, video, sorry. And it does have a little bit of a memorabilia feature in it. And does history on it too. So um, check that out. It's uh, available from um, fan the Phantom Speaks .com is what I think it is, and it's called the Phantom of the Opera: The Angel of Music Edition, and it is a production from Shadowlands Production. So check that out. So um, that's all I have for the for you. So check out these three versions of Phantom of the Opera. Or of the original Lancini film. Um, I know you can watch some of them right here on YouTube, so you know, go right ahead. And there are some interesting videos on it, especially upon the the mystery of the man with the lantern and the edit um, from Cinemassacre. So shout out to Cinemassacre. So check them out. And um, that's pretty much it. So everybody have a great day and stay safe. Black Lives Matter. Wear your masks and, you know, social distance and be kind and courteous to others. So until next time, bye-bye.